We're going to talk about both our Kestrel with Applied Ballistics and our Kestrel Sportsman products, and then they'll be around to answer a few questions after. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Brian Litz. Um, here to talk about the uh, Kestrels with integrated ballistics. Uh, there's two models now. Uh, the original model has been out for over a year. It's the uh, the full-on applied ballistic solver that accounts for everything that your bullet will experience. It's everything that we understand about bullet flight. Uh, the Kestrel Sportsman is a less expensive version. It's got some of the more advanced features disabled, so it's simpler to use. The Kestrel Sportsman is about $200 less. There's a, a package with the Kestrel Sportsman that includes a, a weather vane and a companion app that will remote display your solution onto a smartphone. So uh, all of these products are supported with uh, peripherals like that, apps and PC software as well. Um, so that's that's what's available in the packages. Um, we'll talk about the, the value of the applied ballistic solver in a Kestrel, okay? Traditionally, you have your ballistic solver as a handheld and then your weather conditions as another device or maybe you gather them from TV, uh, you know, you have all of these components. The Kestrel, the Applied Ballistics Kestrel puts all of that together so that your ballistic solution is integrated with your sensors, okay? So there's, not only do you have less devices to carry, but there's no chance that you're going to have a, an inaccurate transcription of all that information. You don't have to worry about pressure units or if your humidity is right or if your temperature is Celsius or Fahrenheit. All of that is internal, so it's doing it for you. Um, the applied, balli applied ballistics is, you know, we're very deep into what we do as far as ballistic testing. We have an active ballistics laboratory that conducts ongoing live fire research. Uh, we're measuring the drag curves of bullets uh, on a continual basis. You know, it's not a not a software company that just makes software. It's a ballistics company that that puts the results of our testing into a product that is the most accurate thing available. Um, now. Having said that, we do our best effort to make sure that the information is as accurate as possible, both the ballistic solver itself as well as the drag models, the data for the bullets. Um, but, you know, as shooters, you recognize that there are uncertainties in shooting, okay? Um, muzzle velocity is one of the big ones. BCs used to be a big uncertainty, you know, that's something that we've kind of done away with a, a lot of uncertainty in ballistic coefficients with the measured BCs. But muzzle velocity is still a very big uncertainty, all right? You can input all of your inputs as accurately as possible. In a perfect world, your predictions will be on target out to very long range. Um, but in the real world, you have uncertainties. Now, I'll pass it over to Todd Magnet to talk about how those uncertainties are managed through the ballistic calibration of the Kestrel. All right, so a lot of what he's talking about as far as the uh, ballistic uncertainties. In the past, we've dealt with a lot of different uh, variables, whether you're using a G1 or a G7, which now Brian has come up with a lot of the custom drag curves that we use. So when you look at the first initial thing, when we talk about G1s and G7s, a G1 is a one inch diameter bullet that weighs one pound, right? It's uh, pretty flat and pointed at the end, but it's, it's a huge bullet. You don't shoot a G1, you don't shoot a G7. There's 13 different drag models, all right? They're all one inch in diameter and they all weigh one pound, all right? The deal is the G7 is a closer drag model to the current bullet that you're shooting, uh, but they match up pretty closely with G1 and G7 up through until you hit about transonic. The key deal is now we can actually take a drag model that's made for the bullet that you're shooting not a G7 or a G1 or a G6 or something else. So now we have custom drag models that actually predicts the flight path of your bullet much more refined than we've ever had in the past. So we're not taking just the closest drag model and trying to compare the flight path of your bullet to it, but we're actually taking a drag model that mimics the flight path of your bullet. So when we talk about variables, all right, we have muzzle velocity, we have BC, we have density altitude, that's our variables. That gives us the time of flight to the target. All right, basically, if you have a calibrated chronograph, that's awesome, use it. I've got a, uh, an Ehler 88 system. It's the only one in the world right now. We have it at the place. It's super accurate, it's very nice. Your magneto speeds are another nice product uh, that you can utilize, it's very accurate. We've tested them inside the Ehler 88. Very good system. But there's times that you're out in the field that potentially you don't have access to a Ehler system or a magneto speed or something that's very, very
very accurate as far as uh, muzzle velocities go. So this is where truing comes in, all right? So when we calculate the muzzle velocity, basically what we're doing, we're taking density on two, that's the Kessel's giving us this information right now, it's easy together. You just go to update, hit yes, turn it back off, and you're done. So now you have your density altitude calibrated. We know the BC of your bullet, whether you're using a G1 or a G7 or a custom drag model. So this is a known as well. So really the only unknown is actual real muzzle velocity in the field. So now all we do is have to gather the drop. Right, where you want to gather this is at transonic flight range, which is about 1,340 feet per second remaining velocity. All right, so with a 308, it might be somewhere around 750, 800 meters. All you do is find a target near that range. You want to be within 10% of it to be optimal. 20% is okay. We really don't want to do this inside of a, or outside the 20% range. So if you're looking at 800 meters, I'm not going to true gun at 500. All right, I'd rather shoot through a corner gaff and be a lot closer with that. The reason why is at 400 meters, you can be 120 feet per second off and still be within a minute of angle at 400 with your prediction. All right, and then by the time you get to 800, you're going to go, yeah, this stuff doesn't work. You know, I'm three foot low at 800. It's because the margin of error that you had in your algorithm really didn't manifest itself till it got further out. So this is, again, it's a calibration exercise. So it's the further you get from your starting point that has the cleanest algorithm, which means outside the area that does not have the transonic shock waves touching the bullet. So basically up into transonic flight is where we want to true. The closer you can get to it, the more accurate your algorithm is going to be. So you'll take, gather what your drop is. If the ballistic computer tells you from a guess of what you plugged in on muzzle velocity, if it says, hey, hold 8.2, but I shoot and I hit headshots at 8, 7.8. .8. All I have to do is go in and tell it, hey, I shot at 800 meters, I hit with 7.8, I'm done. It's that fast. It recalibrates your whole algorithm. So at this point, all of my, my supersonic algorithm is pure. I don't have to shoot hundreds of bullets over you know, every hundred meters to gather dope anymore. We're actually, we use science now to gather our algorithm. This is a very scientific problem solving method that we're trying to find when we're actually gathering dope. We can use science and actually gather a perfect algorithm within four or five bullets. That's it. And actually, if you do your job shooting, you can do this within three rounds. So, you know, you shoot one, make an adjustment, shoot, confirm it, and you're done. And guys, when this is done right, we're within four to five feet per second on muzzle velocity nearly every time. I mean, we do this every week with the guys. And on average, I would say everybody's within 15 feet per second, you know, if they do their calibration correctly. Now that means being able to take headshots at distances, uh, having a weapon system that's accurate enough. And, and the key deal is you can take a lot of ammo that you've never shot before, take it out, gather your range card, gather your dope, and do it within about 10 minutes. Zero and gather all your dope out to a mile in 10 minutes. Now when we say gathering out to a mile, with a 308, now that's getting into subsonic realm. So now what we've done is DSF, it's drag scale factoring. So what we've done is taking that supersonic algorithm and done a prediction of what the bullet's gonna do in, sub, in subsonic. And so we're not doing the, uh, dealing with BCs anymore. Basically he's giving us a drag scale factoring, which what that makes us more different than anybody else is, now this is gonna be good no matter what DA you change to. So you can shoot all the way up to a mile, do a DSF if you need to, which just tells it, hey, instead of 20 mils, I hit it 20.3. I plug in 20.3, hit calc, and I'm clean. Now, anytime I change my density altitude, go up 5,000 foot, I still have a correct algorithm. I don't have to do this. I don't have to repeat it again. So we're truing our supersonic algorithm, and then we can true our subsonic algorithm, which, guys, to be honest, if it's done properly in the supersonic, your subsonic with the current custom drag models will be on. If you use G1 or G7, you can pretty much bet that your subsonic algorithm is going to be off. But with the custom drag models, your supersonic algorithm, if you have done enough definition uh, when you refine your truing and your supersonic, your subsonic algorithm is already going to be on. I can't tell you how many times we go out, we shoot out to 800 meters, get it, gathering our transonic or up to transonic a range card and then immediately after that go out to a mile with a 308 and i can't tell you how many guys are actually have a perfect elevation hole we may miss left or right for wind calls at a mile all right but elevation wise we're good with the custom drag models and this is one of the key points that separates applied ballistics from the rest as well as you know dealing with uh 
aerodynamic jump, the vertical component of crosswind. So a lot of the other engines don't deal with that. So where I live, that's huge. We deal with 17 mile hour winds every day average. So if you're not dealing in, if you're outside truing and not plugging in the effects of uh, aerodynamic jump, it's going to make a big difference in your algorithm. Now you're starting off with errors built into it. So like Brian says, this is a calibration exercise. All right, so the more refined you can be, the better algorithm you're going to be working. But the key difference is with the applied ballistic kestrel, it's an easy button. I mean, we, we can take little kids out, say, all right, hey, plug in your gun information, walk them through it. It's very simple. Collect your atmospherics. Hit the button, says update, you're done, set fast, look at your range card, set it up in increments of whatever you want to see, all of a sudden it tells you what to hold at 800 meters, shoot, refine your hold with your bullet impact point. The, the bullet doesn't get to lie, doesn't get to vote. Alright, so wherever it hits is the actual algorithm your bullet's flying on. So as long as you can repeat it with the weapon systems that's that accurate, repeat it until you're confirmed exactly what your hold is at that point, tell the computer, hey, we're not hitting with 7.6, we're hitting with 7.9. All right, roger that. Now it gives you an accurate muzzle velocity that's actually basing the impact. You would have to have that muzzle velocity with that BC, with that density out to, to catch that algorithm. All right, now that means you have a clean algorithm all the way in with a very accurate one. All right, so this is a very simple way to look at long-range shooting. Uh, it's easy. You don't have to understand a lot of the rules behind ballistics. Brian sets that up inside the engine for you. He's making those decisions for you. All you have to do is just tell the computer where your bullet hit. After you've done that, you're going to get a correct algorithm. Now, is it more accurate than actually shooting through a good chronograph? I would say if you have a calibrated chronograph, no. What you will do if you do your job truing or you shoot through a chronograph, you're going to get the same information if you do them both correctly. Once you get into chronographs, there's a lot of differences. All right? What the sky screens are is with the differences. I'll let him talk to chronographs in just a minute. But there's little notches in that bar. If it's not set up correctly, there's potential for error there. So there are errors with both systems, whether you're shooting through chronographs or you're truing. Uh, but this is a very fast way to gain a very accurate algorithm. And with the Kestrel, it just makes it a very simplistic way where you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars and spend days on a range, you know, in shooting a lot of your hard-earned money, you know, trying to get your dope before you go out and go shoot somewhere. And then when you change density altitude, go up on your hunt, all of it's correct. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You're not wondering, well, I just went up 8,000 foot. Do I need to redo this, all this information? You don't. The, the ballistic engine is now a simple button. We'll take care of all of it for y'all. Turn it back over to Brian. And guys, get ready because we're fixing to answer a lot of questions. So if you have one, just raise your hand. We'll uh, repeat your question over the mic for you, and then we'll answer it as we go. Yeah, all right. Uh, so, you know, we could talk about this all day long, but the best thing to do is to take questions. That way we can kind of focus it to what you guys are interested in. So uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Yeah. Yep. Actually, we, we noticed we're using applied ballistics out on uh, out as we can off the off your castle. What we had to do is we had multiple uh, videos to get the loss. We actually had to turn the DC off in order to get the I don't know. I don't know why that is. Yeah. There's something. Okay. So the the question is there's. So they were measuring muzzle velocity, and the algorithm was not predicting where the bolt was actually going. Okay, that's actually, it's not uncommon for that to happen, but when it does, there is always an explanation for it, okay? There is always a reason. You know, one common reason is the elevation that you dial on your, on your turret, or that you hold in your reticle, is not the actual elevation that you're applying. Okay, for example, if you, if you give your program an accurate BC, an accurate muzzle velocity and the prediction is let's say 30 minutes when you dial 30 minutes and you hit a minute low the common conclusion that people will draw is that the ballistic solver had one minute of error okay what is a lot more common is that 
the scope turret had one minute of error in dialing back 30 minutes, okay? Scopes are very precision instruments, okay? You know, 30 minutes is one half of one degree, and to be off by one thirtieth of one half of one degree, you know, that's a lot more likely than a lot of other sources of error, okay? So there are many reasons why things would appear to not be consistent with ballistic solvers, and I promise you guys, in every case, there is an explanation, you know, and it's not that the laws of physics are being broken that day. All right, and that's where, yep, yeah, go ahead. What about the density altitude? How often do you run into true value? No elevation or no Okay, so the question is, how often would you have to true as you change density altitudes and atmospheric conditions? Is that it? Okay, so that's one of the that's one of the good things about the applied ballistics Kestrel is that the ballistic calibration or the truing that is done inside there is done correctly. And what I mean by that is you should have to true it one time. So if you do a good job truing your algorithm one time, the system will be able to adapt to other environments. I mean, that's the whole point. What good would it be if you trued your weapon system in one condition and then went to a different condition and your calibration wasn't valid there? Okay, there there are programs like that. Applied Ballistics isn't one of them, right? Once you true, you don't want to go Yeah, once you true it, you leave it alone. Now, when you're truing it, it's very important. You have to take greater care when you're truing your ballistic solver than you do when, whenever you're just trying to hit a target. Okay, if you're trying to hit a silhouette target at 800 meters, you know, you might not have to dial for Coriolis or aerodynamic jump. Those are things that might be under a click, okay? But whenever you're truing your ballistic solver, if you ignore those little things, you know, another one is range. You might be able to mill a target around 800 meters and hit it, move on. If you're calibrating your ballistic solver, you can't mill the target. You have to range it and you have to know within a meter because if you have, if you have 10 meters error in your range and you calibrate your solution there, well, now the solver is going to think that your muzzle velocity is maybe 20 feet per second less or more than what it really is, and you carry that error with you forward to every prediction that you make after that. So, whenever you're truing your solver, you have to take much greater care to do that. Take your time, do it slow, shoot carefully, account for everything, and when you do, you, now your your calibrated solution will follow you into any environment and will be accurate bring up a point about density altitude. Guys, it, it takes about 14 degrees at one altitude to change you by 1,000 foot of DA. So even with a normal 308 running 2,600 feet per second, running a, uh, a G1 475 BC, you're probably talking about 2,000 foot or 2,000 foot DA change in 28 degrees. So yes, you do have to manage it. You have to just, you know, turn on the Kestrel, hit update again, turn it back off. There's certain ways that we tell you, you know, it's better than others. If the wind's blowing, you just hold it up into the wind, hit the update button, let it calibrate the wind, let it settle the wind out, and then turn it back off. All right, we don't lay this on the ground with it currently updating the whole time because the ground's hotter. All right, so it's pretty easy to lay this on a black shooting mat and it get 20 degrees hotter than the actual ambient temperature of the bullets flying through. So once we gather, if the wind's not blowing, we'll spin it around and let that uh, ambient air uh, flow around that little device to allow it to give us the current at ambient temperature. But guys, you gotta understand, when you're looking at a uh, 2,000 foot change in density altitude with a normal 308, you're probably only talking about 0.3 mils at 700 meters. All right, so it's not that much, it's a minute of angle. All right, there is, that's a whole bunch to me to be off a minute of angle, but I'm not gonna just walk away from my Kestrel and not update it once it's changed 30 degrees. All right, so go ahead. No, the question is, do you take the temperature into the wind or out of the wind? I'm actually gonna hold the unit up just like this. This is where your uh, humidity and your temperature is blowing through. So I want the ambient air temperature to blow around that little antenna. All right, so I'm gonna just sit here and hold it to there and watch my temperature until it stabilizes. Once it stabilizes, I turn it off, lay it down beside me and continue reading. Yeah, you can gather the wind speed at the same time. Of course, that's a whole nother process and when we talk about, you know, you can flip this out and actually point it into the wind until the impeller quits turning. And at that point in time, 
time I know my direct uh, my direction into the wind because a lot of times I see guys actually just go like this, see what the highest mile hour they can get, and then they think that's where the wind's coming from. That doesn't work that way. All right, so if you'll turn it into the wind like this until the impeller stops, and sometimes you have to work back and forth, it'll stop, it'll start, it'll stop, it'll start, and then you look right down the seam and say, all right, my wind's blowing from that direction. I'm shooting in this direction. So that's about a 30 degrees, all right? So now I know I'm half value in my wind call. So we can work on the cosines that way instead of just guessing where the wind's coming from. That's a good point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So is this learning in the Kestrel unit? Yeah, the ballistic solver is integrated into the Kestrel handheld unit. So um, there is a lot of supporting software and apps that are made to work with it, but everything that you need is built into that handheld unit. You can use that and nothing else to get everything you need. Um, well, you will calibrate the ballistic solver and it will apply that until the next time you calibrate it. Uh, you can calibrate at multiple ranges. You know, if you want to calibrate over the full range of supersonic and establish your muzzle velocity if you find that there's error in your trajectory beyond that you know out into transonic or subsonic you can enter one or two more points out there um, and then it, it you know it will just continue to make it more accurate at those ranges um, but it you can't it's not like you tell it where you hit every time you shoot and it just gradually gets smarter it's you do your best to calibrate it at one point and it'll apply that calibration from then on So the question is, uh, with some ballistic solvers, you can true them at one range, and you're not necessarily accurate for all the other ranges. Is that right? Okay, so there are a lot of reasons why that can happen. I don't know what particular solver you're talking about, but that's not uncommon with solvers that are not entirely properly written. Okay, for example, if you're using a G1BC, and you say, well, I hit here at 700 yards, and, it, and the program will tell you, well, then your muzzle velocity had to be this. All right, now, there's a long list of things that could be wrong with that process, such as the G1 model is not representing the drag of your bullet. So, you know, out of the muzzle, a G1BC might be 0.6. 1,000 meters downrange, it might be 0.45. All right, you can have a 15 or 20% change in your G1BC as the bullet flies, and the result of that is that your trajectory will be modeled flatter early in its flight and then less flat later in its flight. Uh, add to that the fact that you might not be using the even you might not even be using the G1 BC that is accurate for that bullet at all. Okay, and so you can improve on that by using the G7 BC. The custom drag model will get you even even closer. But there's guys, there's a long list of little things that can go wrong with your ballistic solution. You know what he's talking about, guys, when you get a suggested BC from the manufacturer, maybe something like the Sierra 175 that we use training military guys all the time, it comes out as a .496 to .505, it's a suggested from the from the manufacturer, Sierra. All right, the actual BC that you should plug in into the ballistic solver is .475, all right? Now understand, that BC is not .475 on every bullet that you shoot. There's a lot of acceptance on that. So we're shooting through the AR-88 uh, system. We have .471s, we have .476s with every bullet as they fly through. So it's not just one BC. But the key point to this is, if you plug in a .496 and shoot through a chronograph, don't expect to hit your target long range. It ain't gonna happen. So all of a sudden, you're gonna start to see error in your algorithm. You're gonna go, hey, I zeroed my gun at 100. Well, here's another point. Did you really zero your gun at 100? You laid down at 100, you shot at 100. All right, if you actually look at a ballistic curve, that, that algorithm is gonna marry up within maybe .2 mils, maybe .1 mils, from about 70 meters to 130 meters. So if you're .13 mils high, which is the width of a bullet, all right, if you're .1 mils high with a 308 at 100 meters, your 
a width of a bullet high from your point of impact, meaning your group, the average of your group, you're zeroed at 130 meters, not at 100 meters. So now those little bitty errors start manifesting themselves as you get further out. So all of a sudden it looks like your algorithm's really not matching up. That's why we tell you the true at transonic. Reach as far out as you can with that first one. You don't want to go into transonic, right? The 168 grain is not going to fly well in transonic. So now you said, yeah, but I had a target at 850. I could see where my bullet was hitting. But you're using a G1 drag model, and you're shooting a 10 twist or a 12 twist with that 168. It's a great bullet. Flies well, three, 400 meters. It does not like transonic flight. So by the time you get into the transonic portion, halfway through it, now it tells you, well, you needed nine mils. But So you treat it nine mils, but you come down to 500, and now you're hitting high. You shouldn't have went into transonic to true that particular bullet. Now his bullets, they'll fly well in transonic. All right, so we, but they go transonic so far out that we're usually not trying to true deep, deep into trans. What did you say the speed was for transonic? 1,340 feet per second, give or take. Uh, the speed for transonic, that's the question. It's about 1,340 feet per second, changes a little bit with temperature. Um, all right, guys, we got just a couple of minutes. I'm going to... Uh, make a few closing statements, wrap it up, and then we're gonna raffle away the Kestrel. All right, the big idea here is that, uh, Todd said, this is the easy button, all right? There's a lot of ballistics programs out there and different ways that you can use them with weather meters. Um, there are a lot of pitfalls to that. You know, if, for example, if you're using a ballistic coefficient that was uh, measured against one atmosphere model, but the ballistic solver assumes a different atmosphere model, there's 2% error. Okay, if you're, uh, if you're entering your station atmosphere, if you're entering your station pressure, but your program is, is expecting barometric pressure, you know, there's another error that could be extreme if, if you're at high in altitude. So all of these little pitfalls, you have to be a, a ballistician yourself in order to navigate through to an accurate solution. The beauty of the Kestrel Applied Ballistics device is that the ballistics are done for you. You just have to interact with it as a user, and if you you know do a few key things correctly, you know you have an accurate solution that there are no pitfalls built in because the system is all integrated. Okay, you don't have to be the expert. It's made by the experts and so that the users can use it without those problems. All right, and to to remind you again on the products, you know the. The Applied Ballistics Kestrel is the, all the bells and whistles, the Applied Ballistics, or the, the Kestrel Sportsman is the new product uh, coming right now that's a couple hundred dollars less, that has everything that you need to shoot out to transonic range, okay, for 308s, that's just under a thousand yards, you know, for bigger calories, it can be over a thousand yards, so basically the the maximum practical range that a lot of long-range hunting has done, the Kestrel Sportsman is is plenty adequate for those applications. So uh, those are those are the things that we've got the weather vane mount that allows us to collect data real time uh, and then send it to your smartphone app so that you can have it remote displayed. There's a lot of different peripheral stuff for the Kestrel we support.